Minister Khadebe, guest speakers, and to the most important constituency today, our very special delegates, tomorrow's leaders, a very warm welcome to all of you. Each and every person who is sitting in this room, you are leaders, whether you're leaders in the arts, as we have just seen now, whether you're leaders in business, whether you're leaders in media, whether you're leaders in government, whatever the case is, you all sit here today with a huge and awesome responsibility. So ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Old Mutual, welcome one and all to uh, the uh, Tomorrow's Leaders Convention 2016. My name's Jeremy Maggs. If you don't know, I'm from Power 98.7 and also from ENCA. You're going to see a lot of me today. Uh, I'm going to be very busy on the stage. I hope you don't get bored. Let me start off by uh, giving you a few words on leadership, if, if, if I can. And I want to start off by saying that you cannot major in leadership. There are leadership courses that you can take. There are leadership seminars which can improve your ability at a very high level. But there's absolutely no experience or no substitute for experience when it comes to uh, leadership. Um, I'm not a leader, uh, but in a 30-year career in the media, boy, I have interviewed many leaders. I was just making a note before we started this morning. I've interviewed uh, five South African presidents. I've interviewed one U.S. president, I've interviewed one uh, British prime minister, I've interviewed four African leaders, I've interviewed two archbishops of Canterbury, I've also interviewed uh, the, uh, the, the Williams sisters, I've interviewed uh, Will Smith and Chris Rock. Uh, they're all leaders, um, and I've learned a couple of things from all of them. Let me share five things with you if I can. The first thing, anybody in a position of leadership needs to find the right people. It's the ultimate priority. None of you as leaders can do anything unless you have the right people working with you and around you. That's point number one. Point number two is mutual trust is absolutely essential. It means, to, it means that you need to trust the people that you are working with. I also want to say to you that all of you in your leadership positions, every single day, 24-7, are dealing with adversity. It's a reality of leadership, and if you let the extra stress get to you, and I'm sure that's something that our honored uh, keynote speaker will talk about a little later. He has a lot of stress each and every day. It's going to get to you. It's very, very difficult, except that stress is going to be part of it. The ideas, and I stand in front of you today, and I see a room full of potential ideas. Um, but understand that all ideas that you have have to be grounded in pragmatism. It's absolutely critical that you infuse your own idealism into your leadership style, but understand that it has to be rooted in, in, in pragmatism. And you've never learned, to love, and never learned enough, which is probably the reason why you've all elected uh, to come here today. Um, there are always new ideas to consider, new strategies to try, uh, new events to digest. You're at one today. And the most important thing, as I conclude with my opening remarks, is that uh, you leave this room later on today full of ideas, full of insight, full of information, and full of inspiration. That's exactly why we have gathered you here today. But enough from me. As I said to you, you're going to hear an awful amount from me today. So I'd like to introduce our opening keynote speaker today. Minister Jeff Khadebi is Minister in the Presidency for Planning, Performance, Monitoring, and Evaluation and Administration. It's a very long business card. It really is. Uh, he served as the Minister of Public Works of South Africa until June 1999. He has the ear of the President, ladies and gentlemen, who in turn has his ear. He's an important and critical component of government. Jeff Khadebi, it's always good to see you, sir. The stage is yours. Investing in leadership development is as important today as it was when this program was launched nine years ago. Our National Development Plan, the NDP, which charts the way towards our 2030 vision, identifies leadership as one of the critical ingredients that will ensure that the promise of our Constitution becomes a lived experience for each and every one of us. The basic requirement of the National Development Plan is that leaders provide clear direction to ensure that by 2030, we live in a South Africa that has progressed so significantly from the one that we inherited in 1994, and where these changes are felt by each and every South African in equal measure. Our icon, President Mandela's generation, will always be remembered 
for fighting for justice, for fighting for freedom against the brutal and corrupt apartheid regime. Upon achieving that goal, they set about building strong institutions to ensure that the democratic gains are never reversed. It is therefore important that we continue to take a conscious view to protect, to solidify those institutions of constitutional democracy. And this is the task of our leaders, as well as the next generation, such as those that the Tomorrow's Leaders Program aims to nature. I would like to challenge you as future leaders to think hard about what I've raised with you this morning. Are you up to the task of pursuing your vision, of overcoming the obstacles in your path? Will you have the determination to put those hours to hone in your talents to become the best? My appeal to you is that your focus must include the creation of a society in which there is a shared prosperity. And this challenge requires leaders whose focus extends beyond achieving good quarterly results, meeting bonus targets. It requires leaders who are able to take a broad, long-term view that can place the interest of others above your own. The vision of the National Development Plan is very clear. It needs leaders who will make it achievable. And I thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in a world where rapid change is inevitable, uh, disrupting business has become the norm, and the challenges of life are constantly causing us a collective and individual stress and fear, um, I'm going to introduce you now to a voice of reason, someone that uh, is going to talk to you about transcending the chaos, transcending the difficulties of, of, of change. And this is a person that can help grow individuals and also grow businesses. Um, Alex Granger is going to come up to the stage. He's the author of Find, Keep, Grow, The Radical Art of Sales. And in this fast-changing and often confusing and difficult country that we live in, he's going to tell you the most important thing in all of this, while you're developing those leadership skills, while you're networking, is to stay focused and grounded. I have a call to action, and the call to action is in the form of the ABCs of life. These are not the ABCs that you would have learnt in school about how to read or write. But these are the ABCs that I challenge you as leaders of tomorrow that you must adopt today. What are they? Well, we must take the A and accept the challenge before us. The B, believe in ourselves. The C, convert our thoughts into hopes. The D, the determination to convert our hopes into dreams. We must E, expect challenges along the way. And F, fight while we're faithful until we finish the course. We must G, get God on our side. And H, have a Harvey model of leadership. We must I, inspire someone else today. And J, have a just cause for the life that we live. We must K, keep on keeping on and I'll be a leader. We must M, make every day count. And N, never give up. We must O, overcome our obstacles. And P, put our best foot forward. Forward, we must Q, quit quitting and R, run the race with patience. We must S, strive on while T, trusting in our gifts and our abilities. We must U, use our talents and V, value our time. We must W, wait for understanding. X, x-ray our own lifestyles. Y, yearn to achieve all that we seek. And Z, be zealous until we reach the top. Thank you. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Bradley tells us he's dedicated, not yet, <laughs> when he comes up. Uh, he tells us he's dedicated to helping South Africans empower themselves to achieve lasting financial well-being. Here's the thing, everybody. It's absolutely critical uh, that if you're going to be a leader, a leader, you understand the notion of finance and what you're doing with your money and if you're leading people, the kind of advice that you're giving them in that respect. He's the Chief Executive Officer of Old Mutual Wealth and his passion and commitment to the investment and wealth arena has seen him at the forefront of many game-changing developments. His dedication to promote financial education has been the driving force behind Old Mutual Wealth and his latest book, How Much is Enough? Now you can clap. A major 
area that we work on is to assist our clients in their happiness because we believe that that can enhance their wealth. So the second thing I want you to remember from today is that happiness plays a major role in your wealth. So focus hard on that, work hard, be aspirational, but make sure that it does not come at the sacrifice of your happiness. Because if you are happy, you will be wealthier, you will be a far better investor, and make sure that you capture the investment premium that's out there to ensure that uh, you achieve the objectives for life that you have and are able to live the life that you want to live. Thanks very much for your time. I uh, hope that uh, you got some benefit out of it, and uh, I appreciate being with you today. Thanks very much. We all have our own personal brands. If you're not going to be, or if you're not going to develop your, uh, your leadership style, if, uh, if, if you're not going to understand the notion of yourself, if you're not going to understand that importance of developing a personal brand, you're going to struggle to be a leader as well. I would like to introduce you now to uh, Pulenga Makoliba, who's the head of uh, the School of Branding and Innovation at uh, Henley Business School. Puleng, the stage is yours. We just need the right education system in place to nurture the creativity that is in Africa that we are born with and to empower us to, with skills right, that allow us to create new economies, new industries right, that are more creative and subtle and also resilient. And I believe that the education system that we go through for about 16 years, if we can invest in just the next generation, give it 16 years of tapping into their own internal strength, empowering them, building their self-confidence, their creative confidence, and empowering the innate strengths that we already have. And then just sharpening what we have with skills that will prepare us for the future. We need to really rethink the education system altogether. The current platform, the current education system that is in place cannot help us any further because it is built entirely in the industrial age and nothing much has changed in the education system. Uh, we've, we've looked at a number of, 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 of quotients of leadership today, and now let's uh, talk about uh, hard economic issues, if we can. Uh, Busisiwe Khadebi is an economist with the Nedbank Group. Uh, she's with the Economic Unit. Uh, she holds a master's degree in economics from the University of Johannesburg and an honors degree from the University of Stellenbosch. Her interests include monetary and development politics, and she is one of the few people, either on radio or television, that I really look forward to interviewing, because I know she's going to tell it exactly as it is. If you had to look at the education of a child out there in the South African economy, we know that if your mother has a matric, you have a 90% chance of actually getting a matric as well. If your mother has a university degree, you've got a 100% chance of actually having a matric. So women matter in this economy. The IMF did a lively study that came out just this week that actually looked at about 2 million European firms and they looked at the number of senior women in those firms, and there was a positive correlation with how well the company was doing and how many women in senior leadership positions they had in that company. It's that Sue out there. It is Sue that we usually tend to ignore and think, what questions is she asking here? So I'm standing here with the leaders of tomorrow, and I want to ask you, next time you hire someone in your particular firm, next time you want to do any policy Thing around your firm or around even sort of government policy, are you thinking about the Sues out there? Because using both Sues out there and using men out there will just be for the betterment of all South Africans. How will you do good by Sue? Busisiwe, thank you very much indeed. And it's a pertinent question which will segue uh, into our next uh, conversation. And I'm going to lead a series of panel discussions today, ladies and gentlemen, on different aspects of uh, leadership. And uh, the first uh, subject that we are going to tackle today is something called agents of change. So I'm going to ask uh, Matsi Modise to join us. First of all, Managing Director of uh, Simodisa. It's an industry association whose mission is to accelerate entrepreneurship by collaborating with policymakers to enhance the success rate of high-impact, high-growth entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurship is absolutely critical. Matsi, are you ready to join us? Uh, Kanye Dlomo, are you with us as well? Um, Kanye Dlomo has enjoyed a media career as an award-winning television news anchor. He's the publisher of Destiny and Destiny Man magazines. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Christine Ramon is with us, a qualified chartered accountant. She joined Anglo Gold Asante as chief, uh, chief financial officer and executive director with effect 1 October 2014. Christine, please have a seat. She's held senior financial management and executive positions in uh, various companies. Uh, Basani Maluleki is with us as well, director of Transcend Capital and a co-founder of African Century Ventures. And uh, Kanisa Nkamani is a qualified actuary and currently a full-time MBA candidate at the Columbia Business School in New York. I am terrified of actuaries. And please have a seat here. Wow. This is a fairly intimidating group of people that I have to engage with. Um, you sure there's no one else that can host this panel discussion? Okay. Kanye, yeah. let me start with you, if I may. All of you are in a position of leadership. Uh, in one way or another. Was leadership thrust upon you, or have you grown into the job? Uh, were you born to it? Um, I think that's a, a, a quite a difficult question, um, Jeremy, and I don't think that there's one answer. I think that several things happen. Um, in terms of being born into leadership, I think a certain aspect of one's childhood, whether it's examples of people that you see as you grow up, um, or what you read, or education exposure that you've had, certainly some leadership uh, brushes off or rubs off on you from there. Um, but there are instances where one is thrust into leadership. Um, you know, I think of Madiba's quote that says, you know, something along the lines of, circumstances often call upon a generation to lead and to rise up, and that's mm -hmm. not something that you've created. Leadership is thrust upon you. And once that happens, you then have to grow into that position. So I think it's a combination um, of different things, and it just depends on the circumstances, which aspect mm. of leadership uh, manifests. Matsi, I'm going to assume that you agree with much of that, so let me move on and ask you how you've grown into leadership, and perhaps more importantly, where the obstacles have been, where the difficulties have been. I think it's important to you know, navigate through the sphere of life. Um, for example, I started off as an investment banker, and then I decided that's not going to work for me. I need to pursue my purpose and perhaps also my passion. Why didn't an investment banker work for you? Well, I mean, it's a heartless environment, if I had to be frank. You know, it does not have a heart, and it's about how do you walk into an institution, work from nine to five. And as young as I was, 23 years old, I felt like this cannot be it. You know, there has to be more to life. So then throwing myself out of that, I realized that, well, now I'm going to pursue my passion. And it so happens that the things that I love then propelled me into positions of, you know, perhaps leadership because I'm passionate about it. I'm going to drive it. You know, I'm really, really pushing something that I feel very strongly about. So, you know, when you are in that kind of environment, you have no other choice but to lead and to fulfill your own purpose and to essentially just pursue what it is that you want. And then you'll be regarded as a leader in your I'm a leader in my own world. You know, it's, it's great that everybody would perhaps see me as a leader, but in my own world that I've created, um, I feel like, yeah, well, the purpose is clear, and I just have to push and ensure that you know, I achieve what I need to achieve. And it's great that you know, many people might want to come onto the journey, and also my purpose is one that has to do with how do I empower others? How do I empower a space in South Africa, which is entrepreneurship, um, that's going to empower everybody else? Christine, what's the purpose that you've had to fulfill in your growth towards leadership? You know, I guess in my 20s and 30s, it was about making a difference. Um, and it was probably a little bit more selfish than, than where I am today. I think um, having matured now uh, in the corporate world, um, and I don't think you can sort of separate your, uh, your job from your life as much, because I think if you had to ask me the same about my life, it is now more about uh, empowering others, um, about developing others, and, and really seeing how we can hold the torch for others and, and help them be and fulfill their own dreams going forward into the future. Basani, one of the speakers spoke about uh, the importance of happiness uh, in your life. Uh, the interesting thing was happy people make better investors. Mm. Um, are you happy? <laughs> And how do you deal with that whole notion of happiness? Because often being a leader comes with onerous responsibility. I have met very few leaders 
people are happy all the time. I think you have to cultivate your own happiness. Find the things in your own life that will bring you happiness because the ups and downs of life are hectic, as you said, right? Um, I think looking at the economy alone, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to find happiness when you look at the um, economic outlook. So I think for me, happiness is important and I make a habit of reading and doing the things I love to, to inculcate that happiness. Um, and I, I fully agree. I think if you can't have your own happiness in your own life, it's very difficult to nurture other people. It's difficult to be happy and to celebrate other people's success. Um, and it's difficult to drive people to achieve results. And as a result, your business, I think, will also suffer. So it's, happiness is definitely a critical ingredient to success. Tanya, so what about you? Are you happy? Not right now, but uh, <laughs> generally. Um, as it relates to the question around happiness, I think I agree very much with what Basani said. I think it's about trying to understand and be clear around those things that make you happy and spend as much time in those activities as you can. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we can be happy all of the time, uh, but I think it's around sort of making sure that you've got the right kind of proportionality um, in terms of how much time you mm -hmm. spend doing those things that give you that joy and that happiness. Folks, this is a discussion about personal ownership of your business space. In other words, how to get your employees to take better ownership of the organization that they're working in. So let me start with you. And given, let's, let's start at the end if we can. Often, business leaders, business executives, young leaders are afraid to step up to the plate. They're afraid to have a vested interest in the organization. How do you encourage people to do that? Uh, a work environment, it's, it's a partnership essentially. You know, each and every individual who comes to the office have got their own ambitions and aspirations and fears. The only reason you hire them is because you somehow believe that they hold a set of skills or passions or abilities that will complement yours. So call it some kind of a partnership of dreams between the organization and the employees. Mm -hmm. And at the helm of that, it's got to be the originator of, uh, of that proposition. And in most cases, as the guys who are sitting here in, in front of us. But Zenith, that partnership of dreams that <clears throat> Given talks about is often a very divergent path. The employee is going to have a very different dream to perhaps the vision that the owner of the business has got. Very difficult sometimes to coalesce those two lines of thinking. How do you do that? Is there a silver bullet there, do you think? You know, I always say that um, let, it, let it start from me. You know, and uh, as a leader, you've got to be in a position to then know that, okay, fine, this is my quality. This is, this is my team's quality, individually so. Individual sessions are, are, are what works for us in the business. Uh, we've got individual sessions where we, where we speak with what each employee, we say to them, where do you see yourself in two years? Or in a year or two years? We, we kind of live the philosophy that, you know, learning by doing, and you need to fall to sort of, you know, learn to all to take ownership and pride of what you do. I mean, <clears throat> and I, I agree, I assume most of our guys here sitting have, you know, fallen before and have maybe closed shop before and, and done it again. And I believe that within, without, within Elegance Group, it is really important for us people to be able to work on your own and do your own thing as long as you come up with a result and a solution. I think it's less for me of being there every day and, and guiding someone and, and holding hand, it is really more about being able to have an aim, have a goal, and achieve it. How you achieve it is, is the, a path you have to figure out sort of on your own. Everybody does it different. But the key is, if I keep holding hand to someone the entire path, it will never allow him to actually do his own step and you know, point the toe out of the window and, and take the little risk that it needs. So it's, <clears throat> it's sort of a part of... Um, guidance, but not nurturing, and being able to push someone a little bit over the edge and take risks and be able to actually follow through. If you fail, if, you, if, you, if it succeeds, even if you fail, you need to take the experience out of it and uh, grow from there on again. But, Nicholas, in, in a country where 0.2% growth has been predicted this year, um, that's a luxury. You simply cannot afford risk these days. In fact, I would say that we are living now in more of a hand-holding economy than we've ever lived yeah. in our lives. So I think it's, it's nice that Max has, got the, uh, Max has got the theory, but the mm. practicality doesn't really work. You've got to balance. In terms of trying to create, I think it's from a culture perspective, getting, if fundamentally the people are going in divergent views, you've got a bigger issue in your plan, risk or no risk, or growth or no growth. So, but there must be some divergence. 
There must, yeah, there must be, but uh, generally, I think for an organization to be really effective, if your organizing principle or the type of goal you're trying to go to doesn't rally everybody towards that same direction, that's where you'll start to get these divergent views, etc. So from a risk perspective, you need the groups of leaders. So if you want to mitigate the risk, let's say, or say we're all in it together, your leaders need to be strong enough to create that vision, create that strategy that everybody works together towards, and as much as is possible, get everybody operating in the same direction. And if everybody's going in the same direction, you at least have a better chance of success than you do if you've got diverging directions. And that's reality. It happens. People have different opinions and views. But as much as impossible, as is possible, sorry, your, your leadership team needs to be able to focus and stay committed to a cause. You've got to make a decision and you've got to execute on it and you've got to trust each other. The role of the leader, and I'm only sharing my own experience, when we started our business, I thought that the role of the leader was to get stuff done or get things done, as you say. And I realized very quickly that the role of the leader is actually not to get things done. The role of the leader is actually to create a culture in the organization that will drive the goals of the organization. And once you've got the culture right in the organization, which is, in my mind, the sole role of the leader in a business, get the culture right. Once the culture is right, it doesn't matter where you steer the boat, the engine will start to work. And you asked, how do you recruit these leaders? So it again goes back to culture. In our organization, we made a decision that we're going to hire on culture only. We don't care about your ability. We care about your culture. And if your culture's right, we'll hire you and we'll give you the ability. And when we made that change in mindset, the business became much more nimble because we could then steer the boat left, steer the boat right, and we had the right culture. Um, Stephen, pick it up on that, uh, the whole thing about hiring for culture. Do you think it's a good idea? Um, yeah, I, I do think it's a good idea because you need to link yourself with like-minded people, people who get you. Because the thing is, with working creatives, you know, their minds are all over the place, but you just... Which is what you want in the first place. Yes, You want exactly. those minds all over the place. You do yeah. want them. You want to give them that freedom, mm -hmm. you know, to, to be creative in their field. Um, we work with different creators from um, makeup to stylists to everything to designers. So they, the people that you put in charge of those different departments need to make sure that you know, they, they share the same views and culture as, as you do. Panel members, before you go, I, I'm just getting word in, in, in my ear that there's a problem outside uh, the convention center. I know that we've got live cameras. Um, are we able to just look at the screen and perhaps see what is happening? Ladies and gentlemen, Beatbox Morgan. Thirty seconds to activation. <laughs> together. How you guys doing? Oh, check the helicopter's just leaving. My name is Morgan Beatbox. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to take you guys on a journey of music. Please be advised that all the sounds you guys are hearing is all coming out of one human's mouth. There's no added tricks, no added samples to make me sound very cool. You guys have heard my drum kit. What would you guys say if I could add some bass with that? <laughs> 
at the same time. If you guys close your eyes, it's going to sound like there's two people on stage. There's only one. Here we go. Drum is <laughs> it up. Next to, the, next to the robot, I have a tap dancer. Drum kit, robot, tap dancer, all at the same time. You guys ready? Drums. <laughs> is what we call beatboxing. You guys are from Earth, right? <laughs> Welcome one and all. It's good to have you with us. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. Thanks. Um, Thank you. I think the thing that works best on discussions like this, or in discussions like this, is the narrative, is the person's story. So I'm from um, a small town called Ekomani in Eastern Cape. Um, Where's um, that near? Near it's, where? It's near King Williamstown. Okay. It's also small. It's also small. Oh, East London. Okay. Yeah, it won't. Um, so, and I went to school there. I went to a township school called Maralo. I qualified to go to Wits um, in 2010. And I did my undergrad and my honors there. And I'm currently doing my master's in African literature. I produce, I've, I'm a freelance producer for a show called The Big Debates. Uh, but we do more than the big debate. We do a lot of social, social, um, social economic rights content. So we focus on quality of healthcare, quality of electricity, people's access to social economic rights in general, like education. And now we're currently working on a in a documentary on the 20 years of the Constitution, mm. and whether the social economic rights that are enshrined in the constitutions are uh, our lived experiences for a lot of South Africans. I'm also very importantly a fallist. I am a part of the young people in this country calling for the decommodification and decolonization of education. Um, so I grew up uh, in a country called um, Danzane, which is uh, it's just on the outskirts of East London in Eastern Cape. It's the second biggest township in South Africa. And uh, my mother was crazy enough to take me out of, of Mtanzani and send me to a school called Southern College in East London. And uh, I think from, from, from that transition, my story then began because I distinctly remember from the age of eight, I used to live two lives. So for 10 hours of my, of my day, I'd be in suburban East London where I'd be with middle class you know, uh, individuals, both black and white, and then at half past four, I catch a taxi or a train back to the township, you know, and then, you know, it was a bit confusing, you know, trying to make sense of, of, of my world, you know, uh, on one side, I'm not privileged, the other side, I'm privileged, uh, the other side, I'm accepted, the other side, I'm not accepted, you know, so, so th that created the narrative of my life. And, um, How did you deal with the dichotomy? I think, as a, as I think when you're a child, you, you, you're very intelligent. So you, for me, if, if I look at it now in context, I used, uh, I used anxiety. So, so what, what, what anxiety, unlike depression, depression is, actually, depression is a reaction to what has already happened. So anxiety is being scared of what might come. So what I did, I think I took all those emotions and I put them in my subconscious. The, the feeling of, not, of, of being unwanted, not being good enough, you know, being out of place. And, and so that's how I suppressed those emotions and I, and I never really, really dealt with them. But what it did, I think, gave me was the confidence. Because on either side of, of the world, I always had to stand up for myself. I always had to fight for relevance and so on. For an example, I'll always be the only black guy playing 18 sport, you know, but I'm from the township, you know, the, being the first black guy to get school honors, being from the township, you know. And uh, again, what that did, the narrative of South Africa celebrating mediocrity, mm. where as a, the first black guy to come from Tanzania to get school honors, like how can you celebrate that? Where you should be actually celebrating that excellence on a broader scale, you know? So I, I, I went to varsity, I studied in, uh, in, uh, in, in Port Elizabeth, I've got two degrees in construction management and quantity surveying. And then uh, for my sins, I work for one of the biggest property developers uh, in, uh, in South Africa. And so from 95, I'm a property developer. 
So throughout, that, throughout this journey, what I, what I got to see was that life is not fair. And again, it didn't make sense. Why, the, why do these guys get fished with, my, uh, with a car from a sport and have to wake up at half a sport to catch two taxis or a train just to be on time? You know? and, 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 and again, it didn't make sense. Why, why is that? And I, until I started reading. So when I picked up reading, I think at the age of 14, like reading, reading like real stuff about South Africa, that's when I got to understand the context of my country. So things then got to make sense. That I think for a lot of, a lot of people, they are where they are, not because they are good enough, but because the circumstance allows them to be there. Okay, so I had multiple surgeries, and my last surgery was called um, external fixation. And basically what they do is they break your leg in two places, and they pull the bones apart over time. And your body's amazing. It actually heals itself. It creates new bones. So at the moment, I have bone that's 21 years old and one that's about a year old. So during that surgery, um, you have pins going through your skin for about nine months. And I picked up an infection, and it was not responding to antibiotics. So then I had to have um, emergency surgery to remove some of the pins. And then I just decided being at school was not conducive to healing. So I decided, let me leave school for now, and then I'll come back to it. Um, Why was being at school not conducive to healing? Because you're supposed to elevate the leg, and I couldn't in school. Oh, so it, was a, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a physical thing? Yes, it, it, was no, yeah. okay, yes, it gotcha. had to stay on the ground, and you're around a lot of people, germs, you're you exposed to a lot of germs, so it was not working out for me. So I said, okay, let me drop school for now, and then I'll pick it up next year. But then being the person that I am, sitting at home for a year, didn't make sense. I got bored after two weeks. Um, I said to my mom, um, I think I want to have my own fashion show, because that's what I was working towards at school, to be part of the school fashion show. A little mini thing with a few people. So then I also started a blog called um, the X fix factor explaining about the external fixator because as I went out in public everyone would ask me oh what happened to you were you in an accident oh this looks like something from a horror movie so I had to start educating people about Blount's disease and what the surgery is about because um, Blount's disease is most common in the black community and a lot of people don't get treatment because a they're scared of surgery oh my goodness I'm going to die I'm like I've had five I'm not dead yet you can do it you'll be okay so I had this You've surgery. got loyalty points at the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, the medical aides hate me. I'm sure every time they see my name come up, they're like, no, no, not this one again. <laughs> so, yes, and also the equipment is very expensive. So to find out where can you get this done, because my doctors were very amazing and finding me second-hand parts, a brand-new external fixator is 100,000 rand yeah. on its own. So then I thought, well, since I'm doing my fashion show and I'm raising awareness about what I have, um, I decided to commit some of the proceeds from the show to the um, Walker Mouth Center for um, Advanced Orthopedics because they do do some pro bono work. Um, so I was like, okay, it took me 19 years to finally be able to walk normally. If I can shorten that for another child and have them have less surgeries, that was worth it for me. Mind Tricks Media. Becky, what's your story? Um, I'd done some gross errors in my age at 13, and, um, you know, I was kind of expelled from school and barred from entering all schools in the country, so I didn't quite trust people in authority because every time I tried again, they'd kind of remind me of my mistakes and my setbacks in the past. So I think that fueled a lot of anger um, within me in trying to really prove to people that I can actually make something of my life and that um, you know, pain and agony was what fueled me into where I am today. So to break down the narrative, um, being in control meant I, I, I was in control of how much money I earned. I was in control of you know, how I dressed and how I felt and everything of that nature. So I started selling peanuts at uh, 14, graduated from that business. The money was just not exciting and I started selling fruit and veg. <laughs> Um, you know, because I wasn't allowed to go to school, so I was introduced to creative thinking and creative problem solving, which I don't think is within the South African education system, and it's really just helped me a lot along the way. And um, so I sold peanuts and uh, graduated from that business and then started selling fruit and veg, and I graduated from that business and took the money from that business, started Mind Tricks, which is my first formal business, um, after all my jokes around. <laughs> And then um, I think, yeah, Mind Tricks has really become a bigger brand than uh, myself with uh, an exceptionally great team. And, um, you know, working with clients in about uh, four different continents has been challenging. And I think the one thing about Mind Tricks is that it keeps me on my toes and I'm forever learning new things, which is why I haven't quite graduated from that business. 
So how did you become a nuclear physicist? Uh, for me, it's all about just do it. Impossible is nothing and no man is an island. So what really happens is your network, you must associate yourself with people whom you want to look like when you grow up or inspired or something of that nature. So I try my level best to be around those people. That's where I draw inspiration. Then impossible is nothing. When you've got hurdles, you just have to go over them. Come hell or high waters, you just have to do it. Whether you like it or not. Well, that's me. Give us your story. Um, my, my journey um, actually started in a township back in Durban called Umlazi. Um, I used to actually work part-time for my grandmother. Um, she had a little spaza shop, and she's actually the reason why I got into business. Because I would work for her during the weekends, my friends would be playing soccer in the streets, and I didn't have the opportunity to play because I was working at home. And the sad part is... You sure you're not... That's just an excuse for being a really bad person. <laughs> no, not it's at okay, all. you're among friends, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, so... As much as I, I, I would work for her, the sad part is I never got paid once. She would always make the excuse that, you know what, son, I actually feed you, so there's no need for me to pay you. <laughs> <laughs> so me not being able to get paid for the services that I'm offering actually led me to saying, you know what, the amount of time I dedicate helping my grandmother, why can't I actually start my own business? Mm. That's when I actually started off um, selling muffins. Um, from muffins, even throughout high school, I was selling muffins. From there, I hey, listen, it's one step up from peanuts, eh? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So from muffins, I went on to selling clothes, um, of which while I was selling clothes, I started following a lot of successful people, people such as your Petrus Motsepes, your Sandy Lezungus, um, your Lebo Kunguluses, and so on. And I started realizing that these guys actually own shares in different companies. You know, I started doing a bit more research that how do you actually buy a share in someone's company? Um, that's when, as I started doing my research, I started picking up there's something we call the stock market. And that's basically where my journey began. I started trading stocks while I was still in high school, of which, as I was trading, I started hanging around people that were actually in the same field as me, of which they then introduced me to what we call the currency market, which is what so I was So effectively, you became a day trader. Is that what you were doing? A day trader, yep. pretty much, okay. yeah. So from there, I then started trading on Forex full-time, of which my parents had actually, actually had a dream. What was your initial capital outlay? Do you remember? You know, with, with the first... It was a loan. It was a loan, and it how was much it was it? Um, I started off with 10,000. Okay. With 10,000. Um, the interesting part is that when I finished, my parents wanted me to study civil engineering, of which I did my first year, my second year. Um, in my last year, they did something so interesting that they actually wanted to give me a lump sum. They said, Sandy, how much do you need for the whole year in terms of tuition, transport, and everything? We added all these amounts together, and instead of them transferring to the institution, they gave it to me. Mm. I, I took every <laughs> and I invested it in the forex market. Folks, um, I'm going to leave it there because we, we, we literally have to, we, we've got to move on to our next, uh, our next uh, conversation. Um, folks, I said at the beginning of it this, this, that this had the potential to be inspiring and uh, I hope in the, par in the last 50 minutes or so you have been as inspired as I have. So, folks, thank you very much indeed. I do appreciate it. In, in your climb to success, there's been a lot of hard work, there's been a lot of sweat, there's been a lot of anxiety, all of that kind of thing. But along the way, uh, you've had to, you, you, you have failed, yeah. I'm, I'm sure. How have you dealt with that? I Sh think share some inspiration with us on, right. on, and it's a question for all of you, by the way. I think, to be honest with you, I struggle with failure. Like, I think, coming from a ballet background where you're constantly striving for perfection, failing is like a no-no. So I've had to learn that within the failure, I have to find some positivity. So just because, for example, I'll use in, in ballet terms, just because I didn't do 32 fortes, for example, those are 32 turns, and I did 30. I did 30, okay? Not a lot of people can do 32 or 30 fortes. So it's that kind of thing where I've, I have, I've had to learn to decide, kind of like separate things. Like this was the part that was bad. What did I learn from that? Not the entire thing was bad. But um, I think that's for, for me personally, I'm still learning to kind of deal with failure. I'm not very good. I'm like a high D personality. So we're all about just like get it right all the time. So how, how do you deal with it then? I don't think I deal with it. <laughs> I think that's the truth. I think, sure, I, I, I don't know. I don't think I deal with, with failure. I, I don't know. I don't, yeah. Jen? <laughs> it's okay, it's fine. 
It's frustrating. It's okay. <laughs> Lorna, you're I'm among friends. about to you're, start crying. No. You're among friends. It's fine. <laughs> Good answer. Okay. What about you? I tend to go the opposite. Yeah. When somebody tells me I can't do something, I try to prove them right. So yeah. when I first came to South Africa eight years ago, I didn't know a single person. Um, my partner was transferred here, so I was in a very big position in Hong Kong as a news presenter. I came here, I didn't know anybody. And the immigration consultant said, well, you've got a Chinese face and an American accent, you will never, never be able to do anything in local mm. broadcasting in South Africa. Just look at the television. There are no Chinese people there, and there's certainly no Chinese people there with American accents, so might as well be a housewife. <laughs> <laughs> but something... Maybe I should have done that. <laughs> I would but some, have been a lot less something, stressed out. So, something happened, though. So how, happened. how did you, how did so you that harness that criticism say, yeah. and that despondency that you must have had to turn it into what you've become? Wasn't it around the time the Chinese became black in South Africa? Uh, yeah. yeah, well, that helped a little bit. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was still difficult. And I decided I wasn't going to let somebody tell me what to do. And I thought I would still try. So I applied. I started Googling, I started searching here, there, everywhere, and uh, I said... And the rejections, emails, and the rejections rejection came. After yeah. rejection. No, but I must say, I yeah. think the rejection for me drives me as well, just mm. in terms of when I talk about... Uh, Lorna's back, everyone. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, like if, you, if, I, if, if I came to you, Jeremy, and I said, oh, I've got this amazing concept, please can you help me, you know, and you decide to, you know, take me around and not necessarily help me, this is my theory, this train is going to success. Whether you're going to assist it and put some fuel in it to success, I'm gonna go there, regardless of whether you're gonna help me or not. So, right. in the same way she's talking mm. about from, from that perspective, yeah. absolutely, like, don't even, like that fuels something in me that I will go out and kick some yeah. You know, Shaka, Sh right Shaka, people. Shaka, oh, just hang sorry. on. Mm. You know, for a latecomer to our panel discussion here, <laughs> she's like really taken over, hasn't she? <laughs> she needs to catch up. You know, it's amazing. Peter, you've been very quiet. Yes. Um, I presume each and every time you set out to do something, you immediately factor in what is going to fail. Yes. How do Absolutely. you deal with that? And, yeah. and in fact, one of the things that I do before I leave, uh, and, I, and I speak about this often, is preparing for those what-ifs, the big storms, the... See, for me, when I'm out there, if I fail at something, I potentially am not going to come home. Yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> it's quite a thought. You know, every so time there's no pressure at all, in other words. No, there's no okay. pressure. Yeah. So, every time before I leave on an expedition, I, I mean, I have something unfold before me, and, it, and it's quite an amazing thing as I'm reversing out of my driveway. I look at my home, and I look at everything around me, and I have two thoughts that go through my mind. And the first one is, will I ever see this place again? And that is the reality of, of the expeditions. Have I prepared myself properly? And, you know, what am I going to do if I potentially have a failure um, on that expedition? And um, so there are many things that you can do. But the one thing that I've learned, Jeremy, and I think this is the point that I want to get to, is that if you truly put things in place in your life and processes in place that you know that failure is a part of a, part of a journey, potential journey towards success... Um, you must understand that in, in, when you experience that failure, the best way to overcome it is to be disciplined about keeping that process in place and to nyamazela. That's very quickly dealing with failure, or what do you do? Uh, at, at, in my line of work, comedy, it's so... Because audiences have a very... Sorry, is your line of work comedy? I would never have guessed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, it is, Jeremy. Um, Audiences That's a have a very, have a very um, no, I don't want to get into that. Mm. Have a very short memory. So you could tell a good joke now and then they're with you. Next moment you say something that offends them and they're not. So in a 15 minute, an hour, it's, I'm always, I mean, I, I'm not. You're on, the brink of, you're on the brink of failure. Yes, I'm, diff yeah. I'm literally on the brink of failure. I'll say a name, I'll say a party, mm. I'll say. Uh, <laughs> You know, I'll say different things and different people, just the room is always shifting. Yeah. So, um, I, I, yeah, it is. It's, it's noticing that it's not going well <coughs> and then being able to change subject. So, for, for me, it's, it's literally like that every single time I'm on stage, every time I'm working. Yeah. 
Shaka, what about you? It's not quite as intense as that. Okay. Let's make it up but, then. It's fine. <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, for me, um, because my entire identity is, is um, tied to something bigger than me, um, sometimes failure for me is a, is a communal thing. So if my party is <laughs> not necessarily doing well on one or two fronts, it, it does feel like a, a personal sense of failure. It does, it, you know, I, I do share in a, in a sense of, you know, in a communal sense of failure, as I do when, when we win. You have all been insightful and interesting. Thank you very much indeed. Appreciate it. Folks, the one thing I've learned about living in Johannesburg all my life is that we all work phenomenally hard, but the other thing that we're also very good at doing is we know exactly when to draw a punctuation point on the work week and to let our hair down a little bit and uh, to enjoy ourselves as well. So it is my great pleasure to welcome you now to the uh, hang and loose part of uh, tomorrow's Leaders Convention and uh, we are very excited to bring you uh, an excerpt of uh, Soweto Fashion Week. They told me not to worry. 